everybody. I'm going to invite you all, all who are able to stand and sing with us. This is out. Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the can't get over my name is registered in heaven yes my praise belongs to you forever she's out this is my testimony from there to life cause grace rewrote my story Sons and daughters Bought with blood and washed in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Yes, our God will finish what He started yeah. This is my testimony nature to bless, and the blessings aren't meant to stop with us, but to spill out to those around us. At Kensington, we are passionate about being a blessing to others with the resources that God has given us as a church. We're grateful for the way your financial partnership allows us to make an incredible impact within our walls, in our communities, and around the world. Because of your open-handedness, we can continue this mission to see everyone transformed and mobilized by Jesus. So let's look at the past year together. 
what a year it's been and see how God has been at work in and through Kensington. Baptism is our outward response to the internal work God is doing in the hearts. And it's an action that reflects one of Kensington's core values in Christ. We are loved by Jesus Christ, we find our identity in Him, and we are powerless without Him. Last August, 234 people took the plunge at our church-wide Stony Creek baptisms and publicly declared themselves followers of Christ. It wasn't until I really repaired that relationship and trusted Him um, and brought Christ into my life fully. It was just, it was a long time coming. <laughs> and they're happy tears. Our holiday services brought the good news of Jesus to thousands again this year. During our Christmas services, over 47,000 people came to celebrate the birth of Jesus and his perfect timing in human history. And although these were our first online only Good Friday and Easter services, they were a beautiful moving experience watched by over 60,000 people. Another Kensington value we hold dear is as a family. This means we lock arms in community to accomplish God's mission together. We weren't meant to do it alone. That's why we're grateful to offer small groups, mid-sized groups for men and women, and courses like Alpha, Bible Basics, and Financial Peace University. And 5,000 of you did just that. Nearly all of our groups continued to meet virtually during the pandemic, which just shows how committed you are to live in community. Our retreats were another way we build community together and take some time away to intentionally connect with God and one another. More than 2,000 people participated in one of our retreats, like Rock Your Family, Man Up, our Women's Retreat, Club 45 for fourth and fifth graders, the Wild Retreat for middle school and high school students, and 1829's Rise Retreat. I've never imagined something like this. Um, the way God has walked with me this weekend and touched me this weekend to open my arms up to Him and to accept Him, it has been awesome. When Kensington made the decision back in March to stop in-person services due to the pandemic, we worked together to reimagine services in a completely new form. This value held us close despite the physical distancing. We came together as one church and worshiped as a family. We also had a chance to hear from teaching pastors from all of our campuses, which was a great way to learn from many different people in our time of quarantine. Our students stayed connected too. They had weekly lessons, Zoom chats, family devotionals, and even drive-by visits. And we celebrated alongside the many graduates in our community who finished strong, like high school graduate Hannah Cheshire, who shared this moving original song. You promised that you would. Your plans for me are good. Another value we embrace is from brokenness, which means that we admit we don't have it all together and we don't pretend to be perfect. In fact, we reveal our weaknesses to point to the power of God. One of the ways we care for one another in hard seasons is through our care initiatives, like Celebrate Recovery, Marriage Mentoring, and Grief and Divorce Workshops. This year, we were able to come alongside more than 1,000 people in our community in need of support. Our weekend services are also a place where we invite people to bring their whole selves to Jesus. Two series over the past year were especially impactful in our community. Mastermind gave us insight into mental health and how we as a church need to embrace transparency and shame-free support. I still struggle with it occasionally, but it's a lot easier now. It's a lot easier to deal with now that I have a good support system. I have healthy coping mechanisms, and I know that I have God on my side. In Sermons from the Seats, we flipped the stage and had four weeks of powerful Jesus stories from people in our community. I don't pray to try and change God's mind. I pray that God will help me sort of alter mine to fit his. There is one Kensington value that we pursue relentlessly. It's at the core of our mission and all that we do, for the one. That means we will leave what is comfortable to pursue those who are far from God. So we rally together to love our neighbors in a big way, whether they are around the corner or across the globe. We see our 11 global partners as neighbors and show them love by sharing resources and building relationships. Through these relationships with local, on-the-ground leaders and your partnership, this is what happened in the past year. 
Nearly 1,500 churches started, over 65,000 Bibles distributed, 370,000 people evangelized to, over 47,000 decisions made to follow Jesus, 3,700 baptisms, over 13,000 people trained, 20,622 girls counseled to, and 1,035 girls rescued. This is over 500,000 people, each with their own story and who God knows by name. More than 300 people from the Kensington community left the comfort of their homes to visit and support the work happening in Kenya, Nepal, India, the Dominican Republic, Israel, and more through short-term trips. And I just look at my experience and think of what a gift I received by following that nudge and what God gave me through the experience. Hope Water Project is on a mission to bring clean, life-giving water to the Pokot people of Western Kenya. And they do it by walking, running, cycling, and volunteering at events like last fall's Detroit Marathon, this summer's 5K, and the Asenmacher 100. Even when these races are canceled or become virtual, the Hope Water team still gets it done. Like our two Traverse City ladies who ran self-appointed half marathons and raised over $1,300. Altogether, over $220,000 has been raised for clean drinking water for our neighbors in Kenya. This year marked the 10th anniversary of our sponsorship program, No Child, whose mission is to see that no child goes without food, health care, and education, and the good news of Jesus. Throughout the last decade, with your support, we've been able to transform the lives of over 4,000 children in Kenya, India, and now Nepal. Kensington's own health bank and campus care providers also stepped up to meet the needs in our own community during the pandemic. Hundreds of Kensington families received encouragement and prayer, along with grocery gift cards and help with their electric bills. Another way we're reaching out to bless others is through our school partners program. We partner with 10 local schools in our neighborhoods close to our campuses, which allows us to connect with over 600 staff members and 4,500 elementary students. School Partners is always finding new ways to encourage staff, provide for students, and connect with families. Kensington attenders from across all of our campuses provided school supply items for kids in need and packed and delivered 2,700 Thanksgiving baskets to partner school families, and that impacted 8,500 people. Our Move Out Network has been one of the greatest tools in organizing, connecting, and mobilizing people to make an impact locally. This was especially true during the pandemic. During these uncertain months, Kensington people gave to the homeless, delivered food boxes, sewed masks for frontline workers, helped restoration efforts in Midland, planted community gardens, tutored students over Zoom, and so much more. Our dream with our Move Out strategy is to equip and mobilize people to really love their neighbors and to be the church beyond our four walls. As a church, we partner financially with those in our Move Out network, like FLAG, Detroit's Frontline Appreciation Group, My COVID Response, and House of Hope, which delivered 1,600 lunches to kids in two mobile home communities not receiving school meals. Our community feels seen, heard, and loved. And I know this because the source of I want to help has shifted and is now coming from inside our own community. We are grateful that you are here on mission with us. We're thankful for your presence in our community, for your story, and for investing your time, talents, and financial resources. The challenges this year has brought aren't things we'll quickly forget, but this year has also given us opportunities to be the church in new and meaningful ways. We were reminded that God's church is not a structure where we gather, but it's us. Keeping in step with Jesus as he leads us in our homes, neighborhoods, communities, and around the world. Wow, what a humbling picture of all the incredible ways that God has chosen to use this community to reach the one over this past year. Even during these past few months that have been so challenging and so uncertain, God continues to reveal his faithfulness to us over and over again as we step out in faith with him. So here's what continues to be affirmed in me as I watch our community over the past two decades. God uses his people to bring his hope and love to this hurting and needing world. And as I reflect on the ways that God is using our community, it makes me both eager and incredibly excited about the future. 
I'm deeply honored to have the opportunity to step into this new role as interim executive pastor of Kensington during this next season and to help guide us into a future, a crazy future. You know, I met a friend recently and we sat down and had something to eat and we read Isaiah 41:10 together, which was very encouraging to me. Listen to what God says to his people. He says, so do not fear. That whole concept of do not fear exists all throughout. It's a theme that's all throughout scripture. It says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I truly believe that God is with us. And because of that, I believe that the best is yet to come because it is with the greatest challenges like we've seen over these past few months in this pandemic, that God's church has the greatest opportunity to bring light, faith, hope, and love to this region, to our state, to this country, and to the entire world. God's church is actually built for times just like these. And I believe that Kensington in particular is really built for these times since we've always had this DNA to move out into the world and make a difference in Jesus' name. So I wanna say this to you. Thank you so much for your partnership. And thank you for being on this journey together. What a wild and exciting ride it is following Jesus. And we are so grateful to be on this mission with all of you. Well, welcome everyone. You can clap for that, go ahead. You don't have to be shy. You're a small but mighty crowd. You're masks, but you're doing well. Uh, we are grateful that uh, you're here. Grateful for everyone on stream too, wherever you're at. I know we're heading to the end of summer. We're heading into an uncertain fall. Uh, so you're probably anywhere around our beautiful state or further, but we're grateful that you're with us. I'm really grateful for the technology, even during this time, aren't you? <laughs> that we can actually connect uh, in this really uncertain time. So it's awesome. This is the second week we've shown that annual report celebration video. And we do that really, we're not promoting Kensington, even though sometimes it can sound like that because we use Kensington so much, but we're we're really promoting what God is doing inside our community. And that's the most important thing because if it's just a human endeavor, it's not gonna amount to anything. But if it's rooted in God, and we really do believe it is, it's gonna have eternal value. Long when this, this church is gone, or long when all of us are gone in this church and there's other people in these seats, if it's rooted in God, it'll continue to go and continue to grow. In fact, we're gonna talk a little bit about that today in this series. Normally, we would show that video sometime in June because we always vote for our annual uh, next year's budget as well as the elders uh, in July, by July. And so we usually vote in June. So we'd show this in the beginning of June a couple of times and then we'd vote. Well, next week we are gonna be voting. We're gonna be voting for our elders and for the next annual budget. All of you are invited to be part of that. Uh, we're gonna be voting for our elders. Uh, of course, I told you last week, the top right, the further one is the best looking one of all of them, but you can vote for for those uh, elders, we love you. To, if you have any questions at all about any of that, you can go right uh, to kensingtonchurch.org and ask any question you want. And then, of course, we're going to vote for our new budget that's heading into this new season. It's been so interesting to try to really understand what that budget's going to look like. Uh, but we are actually walking uh, faithfully, and we're grateful that all of you have been so faithful uh, financially with us. If you have any questions at all about any of this, uh, you can reach out to us, and we will answer anything. That's one thing that I've loved about this community is it's just a transparent community. If you have any questions, we will meet with you, we will show you, we will talk with you, and uh, we have no problem with that at all. In fact, uh, it is us as a full community uh, that is on this journey together. So I would invite all of you next week uh, to be part of this, either in this room or online, and you can uh, fill out and be part of voting for all that. But we are grateful to be part of that. Well, we are in this series called Pivot. We started last week, and this is the second week of this series called Pivot. And we're really inspired by the whole idea that the whole entire world, not just our country or our state or our region, has had to pivot during the last several months, haven't you? I know all of you have had to pivot. You've had to turn, you've had to change. Things have come into your life and you're like, wait a minute, I have to do this entirely different way. And so we really wanted to talk about what does that look like? And we're gonna look at the early church and through the eyes of the early church as we did last week. What does it look like to pivot last week? The, the, the whole tagline was, what just happened? Because when something happens, we have to respond to that. And so we talked about that last week. And this particular moment in history is gonna be a moment in history for generations. Our little kids and kids growing up now are gonna be telling their kids and their kids, hey, this is what it was like in 2020. 
I had to wear a mask and I hated every moment of it. You know, I was, there was tension. There were all these things happening. We are actually gonna have this be a marker in time, a moment in history where all of us have had to pivot. And guess what? The church rooted in Jesus has had to pivot as well. We've had to do so many things differently. In fact, even being here this morning, you just feel it's a different time. We're doing things differently. We're pivoting. But God's church is made to pivot. And one of our pl church planners, his name is Clint Dupin. Clint and Michael Dupin used to be the lead pastors over at our Birmingham campus. They really felt a call to plan a church in San Francisco, a San Francisco Bay Area. And so they went there a few years ago and we were ascending church. If you don't know that about us and you heard it in the video, that's one of our heartbeats. We wanna send people out to plant churches and to preach Jesus to communities. And Clint and Michael felt led there. And as you know, uh, over the course of the last few weeks, there's been an intense fire in that region and Clint is very close to that region. And they've had to not only pivot in the pandemic and with civil unrest and with all the things that are happening in the economy, but they're also pivoting now to care for their community as that fire is coming close. They've known people that have lost their homes. They're close to this. In fact, Clinton sent me a little bit of a video that showed that you could see the smoke right down his street. And so uh, I asked him if he would make a video for us and let you guys know what one of our church partners and one of our piece of our family at Kensington is doing all the way across the United States as he pivots. Check this out. Hey, what's going on, Kensington Church? Clint Dupin here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, my wife and I, we lead East Town Church, a church startup that launched from you over three years ago. We're so thankful for you. I was talking to Danny Cox and he asked me to share a little bit about what's going on currently in the Bay Area. Most of you have been watching the news and you know about all the fires, the forest fires that are happening. That is right here, right now. In fact, if you look behind me, you can see smoke um, all over the place. In fact, I shouldn't even be out here because of the air quality. I'm gonna ask you to do something because we are one community, we are one body. We are still just as much a part of you. I'm gonna ask you to join us in prayer. Pray for this community, pray for the Bay Area, Pray that this is a time where people begin to look to God for answers. We just ask that you pray for the firefighters, the men and women that are on the front lines. You lift up those who have already uh, evacuated their homes. We know people who have already lost their homes. We pray for the evacuation centers. Uh, we're able, because of your support, to actually support Red Cross in this community right now that are on the front lines. So we just want to continue to ask you to lift us in prayer, to lift the people here in the Bay Area. A lot of times people probably judge California or judge the Bay Area like man I'm glad I'm not there it's like man the gospel is known to run into the mess not away from the mess this is opportunity for us to be a part of kingdom change and so I'm going to ask you to join with me because you are already with me right to lift this area in prayer we are so thankful for that and we are so thankful for the encouragement that you continue to bring to us God bless you guys <laughs> Yeah, I love Clint. I, I, I so miss Clint. I'm so grateful that they are there and they're in that community and they have reach in that community. We talked a little bit after this and just so you know, uh, they were gonna invest $2,500 into the Red Cross out of their budget. They asked if Kensington would match that and we said, of course we can. We of course will match that. And so we're gonna match that. They're gonna take that gift and Clint said that is gonna do wonders in their community right now to provide water, to provide food and anything else in that community. So know that you're part of that that we're a part of a connection or a network of churches that are changing the world in this particular time especially. In times of trouble, that's the part of the church that's so beautiful historically. When things have happened, and you heard what Clint said, we are the ones that rush in, not the ones that walk away. And even so much now, that is exactly what we should be doing in these times. We should be stepping in. But in order to do that, we have to be healthy to step in. And we're gonna talk about the early church and how they stepped in. But I'd love to pray uh, for Clint and Michael and for that region and for us today. And then we'll dive in and we'll see where God leads us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the dupins. Thank you for their heart for you. Thank you for their courage to hear your whispers and to step out in faith, to start a community of people there that can actually make an impact, especially during these times. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in them. And we ask, Lord, that you protect the workers, the community, and you send your workers, more of your workers. And if there's anything else, Lord, we can do as a community, uh, please let us know. And we'll, all of us will pray uh, at this time for that region. Today, Lord, I pray for us here in Michigan and whoever hears 
uh, my voice in the coming weeks, that we would get a glimpse of the power of how you work through the church through times of stress, through times of uncertainty. Would you give us some practices that we can do today, Lord, that would draw us closer to you? Would you give me a vision individually and collectively of what we can do in this time to make an impact for your kingdom through your spirit? We pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Well, today we are going to be talking about community, connection, belonging. And in these particular times, something's really highlighted. What's highlighted is we need each other. Even looking at Clint, I'm like, we need you. <laughs> you know, we're connected to you. He says, we're already connected, right? We're part of the same family. But you realize that in these times, people start to realize we need each other. Not only that, but we realize that we belong to each other, hopefully. That's one of the quotes that I've said for years here. One of my favorite Mother Teresa quotes. When there is a lack of peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. And is there a lack of peace right now? Well, yeah, there's all kinds of lack of peace right now. Even between people, there's lack of peace. But we need each other. We belong to each other. And I've said this for years. No matter where you travel, no matter where you go, when you meet people, there's a commonality that all of us have. And that is deep down in our heart, in our mind, in our soul, we want to belong. We want to be known. We want to be connected. And I really believe that that longing is placed in the very core of our DNA by God himself. Like in the very beginning of time, it says that God was hovering over a formless and dark world. And it says that God is not just a one-dimensional God, but there are three parts of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, this, this mutuality, this community of God, this communal God that's hovering and he speaks the world into existence. And then there's a moment where God actually creates humankind. You would say the crown jewel of God's creation, his people. And it says this, it says, God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Isn't that beautiful? Don't miss that little bit. Let us make humankind in our image, this communal image, this community that God is actually in perpetual relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit, and that he breathes that into his creation. And do you realize that you hold that DNA? That in your very DNA of a human being, you are made for community. You're actually made from community for community. You're made from belonging, Father, Son, and Spirit belong to each other, to belong. You're made from belonging for belonging. That means wherever you go, if you're following God and you're reflecting the image of God, you're image bearers of God, that means you can bring community and you can bring belonging. That's why God's people are so powerful in the times when it starts to fracture and there's a lack of peace. God's people can come in and inherently bring God who actually inherently brings community and brings belonging and brings peace. We were built from community, as a church for community, from belonging for belonging. But here's the fascinating thing about the creation story. As God creates the first human being, I think he probably looked at him for a while and said, something's not quite exactly how I want it. He has this beautiful connection with God, but there's one element that he needed. And he said something wasn't good. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. He not only needs communion with me, with God, this perfect union that was happening in the garden, but he needs communion with others. I will make him a helper. I will make him a helper, someone suitable for him. And God creates community. And we find out that God knew that humankind, us, needed to be in relationship with each other. We're wired that way. It's in the very core of who we are. From community for community. From belonging for belonging. Solomon, one of the wisest men in scripture, says it this way. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toll. For if they fall, one will lift the other up. But woe to the one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one may prevail against another, two will stand strong against the one. A threefold cord is not quickly Broken. What Solomon is just very simply saying is, we are made for community and community is essential. We're designed for it. We're not designed to live apart and completely isolated. We need each other. One of the most moving pictures during 
this pandemic that we're going through is some of the pictures of people that were separated during the pandemic just before and couldn't get back to each other. Or some of the people in nursing homes. There's a beautiful story about a young man that uh, would go and see his father. And they would, well, like, maybe he's not that young, but he would sit with his father. And they would look at each other. And you could see both of them. And they would talk on the phone. And that's as close as they could get. One of my favorite pictures is this. This is a 90-year-old man. Uh, and that's his wife inside of here. And what happened was she broke her femur just before the pandemic. And she was in rehab. And then it hit. And he couldn't see her anymore. They were married for 60-some years. And every day he would go and just put his hand up. Why? Because they need that connection. We are designed for connection. For community. And this pandemic has separated that. And the church has an ability to actually... Bring it. Bring it back to our community. You have that in you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have that ability to bring community and bring belonging wherever you go. But sometimes in these moments, what happens is when we get pressed down, we actually start to isolate. We start to pull away. We start to hoard things. We start to actually pull this way, right? We have a lot of toilet paper in our home that we will use for the next 20 years. And so we tend to be isolated. This past week, I, I got to go a few days ago and see my oldest son play baseball. He played in college, but over the summer, he's just having a men's baseball league, and it's really fun. And we decided to bring his dog with him, Finn. He's, a, he's only six months old. And here's what's beautiful about Finn. He has realized that there's a ton of community on the baseball field. And so th show that picture. This is beautiful. The stands were right here. He's sitting there. That's my son behind him. And he knows that when the kids come off the field, every single one of them is going to pet him. So he's like the mascot. So he just puts his head out there and they all pet him. And then every time they go to the bat, they do the same thing. He'll be sitting back and he'll go, oh, hold on a minute. And he'll put his head out there and he gets all the pets. He's like cheering him on. He knows that baseball is a team sport. And there's a lot of community. But as I was experiencing this, I was thinking of a video we did years ago that demonstrates how much we truly need each other. It's all right, man. Yep. It's all right, man. Come on. Yeah. Come on, Stan. Yeah. 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 It's all right, dude. It's only one out. Woo! Come on. Come on, get it, get it, get it. Smoke him one. Go. Smoke him one.
is absolutely one of my favorite videos we've ever done here. It's a super exaggerated version of what it looks like to go it alone. And you can kind of make it for a while. But over time, as you're isolated and you're hoarding and you're pulling back and you're actually not moving, all of a sudden it catches up to you. And you need people. And the church is a community of people who can actually bring that to the world in a time when we are being forced into isolation. We are being forced into our own minds. We are being forced into those things. It's very much in the DNA of who we are. Just before the pandemic, I, I went on a mission trip to, Han, or to Nepal. And as we got there, uh, just before we got there, actually, I had injured uh, my right knee in the end of January. And I, came from, I come from a background where my dad is old school. He, his whole thing to us when we grew up was just shake it off. It didn't matter if you broke your arm, like, shake it off, you'll be fine. You know, <laughs> he just had this pain tolerance, it was awesome. And so I was like, I was trying to shake it off, but it just wasn't getting better. And so finally, a few, I finally got an appointment a few days before I had to leave. And I went in there and the doctor says, I think you have a torn meniscus in your right knee. And I said, well, wait a minute, in about five days, I've got to go trekking in Nepal. And he just looked at me and he said, good luck. Like, you get, money, you get paid money to say that to somebody, you know? <laughs> Good luck. I'll see you when you get back. And so, uh, so sure enough, I got there. It was brutal. I mean, every step I took, especially downhill, was hurt so bad. But we got through it. We actually, that trip of all trips, we trekked more than any other team has trekked in the last year. I'm like, way to go, leader. Uh, so that was, it was really tough. I and mean, I got back, and of course, we're in the pandemic, so I couldn't go and get an MRI. I couldn't really find out what I had. I finally did that a couple months ago. He finally called me a few weeks ago, and he says, yep, you got a torn meniscus. You need to get operated on and you need to go through physical therapy. It shouldn't be too bad. You'll be back to normal. But that's why you're feeling that pain. I was like, oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. It's been five months. But it's one of those things where you realize that when part of you isn't working, what do you do? You compensate in other parts of your body. So as I'm trying to nurse this knee and walk, uh, other things, I feel like I'm about 90 years old right now. All parts of my body are not working right. My back's hurting, my other legs. And so you have to fix this part. And many times that's what happens. We don't realize that something's actually injured until we start to have pain. And when that pain starts to happen, we start to compromise other parts of the full body. And the church, in a lot of ways, pre-pandemic, was sort of limping. Not really seeing completely its role, maybe, but as it's pressed down upon us, I think there has been highlighting many of the things of the body of the church that we could actually be better at doing and that we're actually called to do. Sometimes when there's not something pressing down on us, we don't feel the pain. But when you feel the pain, all of a sudden you start realizing that something isn't right. And the body of the church has pain. And we're starting to look at that as all of these things are starting to come upon our community. But we have a beautiful opportunity but the church is a body, and I love what Jalen Seawright said a few months back when we did a service together. He said that when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. And when one part of the body hurts, the whole body should rush to that part of the body to repair it and to fix it and to heal it. God's church is a body, a body of individuals designed to work together. 1 Corinthians 12 says this, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Each one of you has a role in the church. Each one of you are designed to reflect God's image. Each one of you are someone that can bring community and belonging to a broken and hurting world. And sometimes the church forgets that the church is a body of people. It's not a brick and mortar building. That's probably one of the great learnings we've had over this, hurt, this time of hurt. Is that you are the church. God's people are the church. Clint Dupin is the church. Michael Dupin is the church. Our global partners are the church, not this wall. And when we can't gather in here, we realize something. We can still do the work. That your contribution and ours collectively is some of the most important work that we could do right now. But in order to do that, sometimes we have to do physical therapy. We call this day physical therapy because we have to go sometimes through things to actually make us healthy. The early church knew the importance of keeping this body healthy and strong in the face of persecution and hard times and hurting. And they discovered how to pivot through aspects or towards aspects of their life that would help them be sustainable. And so that's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at how the early church had practices in place and things that you could do and we can do collectively to be strong so that we can go out and bring community and belonging to the world. 
Here's a few thoughts. The first pivot is this. We need to pivot towards connection and away from isolation. Acts 2 says this of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, one scripture says, day after day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The book of Acts was actually written by Luke. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. And many times if you read the Gospel of Luke, you should read the book of Acts uh, because they really kind of go together. And Luke was a very detailed writer. And in this particular case, he's actually painting a very utopian view of what is happening in the early church. It's very, very positive language. But here's what you should know. In that time, this kind of community was not normal. It wasn't normal to have this sort of community. There were some sects that would actually be able to live this way, some groups of people, and there was a couple in this Greek culture, but this was abnormal. And so he's writing and saying something special was happening in this community, and people were taking note of it in times of tension and persecution and being in hurt and sickness. They were taking note of this particular kind of community. It says that they met day by day. If it was a really close-knit community in this Greek culture, if they met once a month, that would be a very close culture. They were meeting daily. That means that they were actually more like a family than just a group of people. And so they were creating this family that was moving. And did you catch all the words and everything and all the practices they would do as a community? Let me highlight some of them. The early church had physical therapy and it included this. Learning, gathering, eating, praying, sharing, worshiping, and growing. They said that they would learn truth together. You know, what's fascinating is during this time where things have been shut down, I've had so many conversations and people are actually pressing in to learn more and more about God. Now, don't get me wrong, some of the sources are wacky and it's been crazy conversations, but people have dove in to want to understand and to want to learn. We've had time and they've been pressing in and asking questions and it's really been good. There's been Bible studies. A friend of mine said that he had a vision to have a Bible study. And his friend said, do you want to do that every week? He said, no, I want to do it every day. And for months now, at night, at 8.30 or 9 at night, they have a group of people that are meeting every single night. And he's running and he's talking. He's learning together. He says it's been an incredible time. People have been listening to podcasts and attending webinars. This past week, I had a friend of mine, York Moore, come and train our staff on some really interesting organizational dynamics that are happening right now across the country and within our own space of Kensington. And we're learning together as a team. The early church knew that this practice was important, that they would get together and they would learn as a community. They would gather together. How many of you have Zoom meetings almost every week? Let me see your hands. Don't be shy. Some of you, how many of you never want to have another Zoom meeting in your life? Right, there's probably gonna be a big backlash after all this is done. Zoom is just gonna go down to nothing. But it has still felt like we're a community. That's what I've been amazed by. I still feel like we're connected together and we've been gathering in these FaceTimes and small groups, eating together. You know, we have a, a tradition in our home that every birthday we have my parents there and we have just a small group of people. And the first birthday that happened during this pandemic, they couldn't be there. So we took my parents and we got them and we figured out how to put them on Zoom. You know, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the Muppets, but years ago, there was two old people that would sit in a balcony and they'd heckle everyone. <laughs> and, uh, and so we put them on the screen and they were part of this and they were just like, that. like, how is this work? What's going on in there? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm like, yeah, we're fine, we're fine. But it was a beautiful moment because we still felt like we were together and we were having this meal together. But now it's starting to open up and we're starting to have some meals together. We're starting to meet with people. The early church knew that eating together was important, praying together. I think I've prayed more in this time than I did pre-pandemic. The prayers that have happened have been unbelievable. One of my favorite stories and most moving stories during this pandemic is one of our people in the seats here were losing their father during this pandemic. And they really wanted their father to know Jesus. And so uh, he asked Chris Zarbo, he's close to Chris Zarbo. Chris Zarbo is our lead pastor at our Clinton Township campus. Would you FaceTime when my dad is in the hospital? 
And in that FaceTime, Chris brought his father to Jesus. And of course, the Lord does that, but he used Chris. And it was this beautiful moment before he was passed. So it was one of the most incredible moments because we know that it's been unbelievable loneliness. People have not been able to be close to their loved ones when they've been sick. But Jesus is using every bit of technology in every way for us to pray together. It says that they shared together, giving to all who was in need. I think what we're realizing during this time is we don't need as much as we thought. Maybe you're like me, maybe not. But I've realized we don't need as much as we thought. Even Amy and I are starting to sift through what we have. And in the early church, they said one of the core things we can do is share. They worship together. We've been worshiping together online. And that feels funky at different times, but it's still beautiful to be connected. We've had this sort of hybrid going where some of you are here and some of you are online. But they worship together. They took communion together. They had spiritual practice together. And the last one, they grew. They grew as a community. They grew individually and they grew as a community as they were disciplined to go through these things because they knew something. This is the physical therapy you need spiritually. Are you doing those things during this time? Do you have people in your life that you're connected to that you can learn and gather and eat and pray and share and worship and grow? That community, it says, was filled and energized and they were healthy so that what? They could take Christ out into the world. One of the things we've noticed during this time is our Celebrate Recovery ministry uh, was essential. And when we broke out, that group of people that struggles with addictions and habits and hurts and hangups of their life, they need that. I have a few people right now in my life that are struggling deeply. And when they don't have that connection and they don't have that community, all of a sudden we see addictions widespread. We've seen very tragic things actually over this time. What I'm so proud of here is a few of the people in our Celebrate Recovery, a few of our leaders fought to get that online. We have to create something where the people that are struggling with their hurts, habits, and hangups can connect. And they fought through and they created it enough to where people could come and they could actually be connected, right, Jeff? If you saw, like, that's just an incredible connection in our community where people have actually come around and said, here, we need this. This is essential for people to be healthy in this time. So proud of that. So the early church pivot towards connection, away from isolation. The second one is this. They pivot towards sharing and away from hoarding. I was saying, I wasn't here in the very beginning. My wife was sending me text messages when I was in Nepal. And she's like, you're not going to believe this. She'd send me a picture of a shelf and everything was gone. And she was like, this is unbelievable. I can't find toilet paper anyway. I'm like, well, you have to improvise. But it was just like incredible. But we tend to hoard, you know, hoard things and not share. But listen to what the early church says, said this in Acts 4. All the believers were one in heart and one in mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land and houses even sold them and brought the money of the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had anything in need. What's beautiful about this is they're talking about sharing material wealth because there's a great need in our community and around the world. And you see that through my COVID response where people have just stepped up and just an unbelievable amount of material things that people have in need at this time. Different ministries that have risen to the surface that we've been part of, there's material need and people are willing to go and actually get rid of something that they own to actually put it in the church's feet and say, use this. And we've seen that. But also in this, and don't forget this, said the apostles were sharing Christ. Suddenly we're sharing their material things and their time and their talents and their energies. They were going out and sharing their most valuable thing, which is Christ. Last week we talked about Peter and John at the gate of the beautiful with the beggar. And the beggar looked at him wanting material things and they said, we don't have that. But what we do have, we'll give you. And they gave them Christ and it was transformative. And so you see this beautiful thing in the early church knowing that we can do everything we can to give materially, but we can also give spiritually. I've told this story a number of times, but years ago, Amy and I bought a home and about three years into it or four years into it, the home started sinking into the ground. And it was a disaster. 
I mean, we lost everything. And the insurance wouldn't cover it, and it was unbelievable. And it was just like one of the most darkest times. We were just losing everything. Our house was falling out. I was waiting. I, I, literally, I used to have nightmares at night. I'd wake up shaking, thinking we're going to ho- fall into a sinkhole. And we're going to wake up, and we we're just going to be gone, you know? And it was just one of those most intense times of our life. And I'll never forget this. We were new to this community and someone heard about that and they put together people and they said, we'll be there on a Saturday, we'll help you. And at that point, they had torn out our whole front lawn. They had torn out everything. They're trying to figure out how to pin our house back up so it doesn't sink into the ground. And there were cracks all through our house. No door worked anywhere. Nothing would lock. It was unbelievable. And that Saturday, I'll never forget, people started showing up. There must have been almost 20 people that showed up. And within four hours, they had our house painted, they had cracks made, they had the whole front yard done. They had given everything to us in a time of desperation. They shared all that they had at that moment. They left there and Amy said, wow, I've never experienced anything like that. The church has an ability to actually go out and create community and belonging. We actually can share what we have. When we realize that God is the one that gives us all that we have, we can give what we have away. And then we can give him, more importantly, away through our service and our time and our talents and our energies and our resources. This is one of the most important times to do that. And the church is built for that. Talk about building community. They left and I was like, this is a real community. (laughs) There's people that are actually going out and serving their community. So we pivot towards connection and away from isolation. We pivot towards sharing and not hoarding. And then there's one more, but since we're talking about sharing, this is the perfect time to receive our offering. So I just made that. That's a perfect connection, by the way. Uh, no, so uh, if you've come prepared to give, awesome. If you're giving online, thank you so much. Uh, if you have brought anything today that you do want to share uh, financially with us, we're, don't, we're not going to do that by passing out the pouch. But when you leave, there's actually buckets in the back and you can drop something in there. But most of our giving now all is online, which I'm so grateful for. Uh, KensingtonChurch.org, you can give there. You can give through our app, Kensington app, which I would say just download the app, please. Uh, it connects you to Kensington across the board. And then, of course, you can text 77977 to Kensington. And here's the thing about our community that I always find unbelievable over the past two decades. These moments are the moments (laughs) that this community shines the most. In the moment where Clint said, would you please partner with us, this community says yes. And so that is because of your generosity, your giving, and your partnership. So thank you for doing this. Well, here's the last one. We towards connection, sharing, and the last one is this, pivot towards movement. If any of you are a physical therapist, you know something. The most important thing to do to get healthy is what? Move. (laughs) This past three, five months, I've had to force myself to move on this knee. If, If I don't, it locks up and I cannot walk. It's horrible. And what do you have to move in order to get healthy? The church has to move. And they have to move because the culture is watching. The world is watching. This past week, I put out an article to some of our leaders in this community, uh, our executive team and some of our teachers. And here's what this article has said. It says, why the, why the Christian community's desire to physically assemble falls on deaf ears. And this particular author was claiming that people in the world care more about opening the casinos than they do about churches. Primarily because most churches aren't doing anything during this time. They're not connecting. They're not going out. And they're not doing a physical work in the world. They're not moving. And this is what he says. In today's culture, a church's impact isn't measured by its theological position or doctrinal statement or its style of worship. But by what can be seen by the outside world. When it comes to visible impact, I have to say that the vast majority of churches are invisible. And if the world doesn't see any clear visible evidence of the impact a local church makes then they see little reason to keep it open during a pandemic or during any crisis. And not to be dramatic, he writes, but if that invisibility goes on too long, there will come a time when they won't have any difficulty deciding a church has no value at all and eventually be closed entirely. As the church moves in this culture, the culture is watching saying, what are you bringing during this time? These times of crisis. The early church knew that that was important. It says in Acts 5 that there were many signs and wonders done among the people throughout the apostles, or through the apostles. Yet more than ever, every believer was added to the number, great numbers, men and women, 
And a great number of people would also gather from the towns around Jerusalem and they would bring the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits and they were all cured. One of the amazing moments in history, if you look at the historical nature of the church, is that in, during these times of pandemics, during these times of illness, during these times of plagues over the years, when people had run away, when leaders had run away, the church moves in, just like Clint said. This is our moment to move in. And as we move in, we bring healing. We bring community. We bring belonging. In the early church, when the plague broke out and people saw the church come in and come close to the people and, 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 and provide care and healing, they said, what is that? They would adopt children at the time when adoption wasn't even a thing in that culture. You wouldn't bring in a stranger or adopt them into your family. The church would adopt them and bring people in. And when people saw that, they said, what is that? In fact, the growth of the early church had a lot to do with how the church engaged at some of the hardest times in the world. And they said, what is that? And they could say, that's the power of Christ moving in the midst of hard things. The world is watching the church and its people, especially during these times of crisis, to see what tangible evidence there is of the power and evidence of Jesus. The early church knew that we needed to pivot towards connection and away from isolation. Pivot towards sharing, away from hoarding, and pivot towards movement or action rather than sitting still. So here's a couple action steps for our community this week for you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you three questions. I want you to contemplate them. The first question is this. Who can you connect with this week? Who is someone that you can connect with this week? Do you have someone in your mind? Someone that you can connect with this week? Maybe you're a person that needs connection. What I would say to you today is, go out in this hub if you're here in this room, if you're online and watching, would you go to our website and would you reach out? Because we are not made to live in ice alone. We're made to live in connection. And what's fascinating to me is uh, I was reading a Brené Brown book and she said in the 1980s, when people asked who was lonely, it was about 20%. In recent years, it moved up to 40%. During this pandemic, we don't even know the percentage of people that feel isolated and lonely. And the early church knew that connection and community and belonging or core, who can you connect with this week? And if you need connection, can you reach out? One of the ways that we can connect this week is actually uh, through small groups. Normally what we would do at this time of the year is we'd say, hey, we're gonna try to create groups and we need leaders of groups and we're gonna move out into the community and we're gonna have groups. Well, guess what? That's been compromised a little bit. So we have to pivot that and we're gonna be doing virtual groups. And so we would love for some of you to host those virtual groups. All you need is a computer, and a willing heart, that's it. We'll help you with everything else, but you can open that up and host a group. And it's beautiful. You can sit in your own home, open it up to a Zoom conversation and have community right there. Good way to connect. And so if you wanna learn more about that, just walk out to the hub in the lobby or please connect online to our small groups section. We love to do that. As far as sharing, let me say this to you. What is one thing that you have in your possession that you can give away this week to someone in need. It's one thing that you have that you own that you can give away this week that will be a help to someone else. I'm always amazed at how much stuff I have. <laughs> you know, going through all of that and we're whittling through and like, we don't need this, what are we doing? Let's reach out and give away, let's connect and see the need in our community. There's a beautiful story when those stimulus checks came out. There was all kinds of stories of people saying, I don't need this right now. There's a great story of a couple, I don't even know where they were, I read it years ago, or months ago. But they got the check and they were in a restaurant and they heard this young single waitress talking about how she couldn't make her rent or something like that and they just gave the whole check to this person, covered her for like three months or something. What do you, what do you have in your hand this week? What do you have that you own that you can share and give away? Could be material, most importantly a spiritual. Who can you give Christ to this week? Who can you meet on top of mind and say, I'm gonna share Christ this week with them? Last one is this movement. Where can you move out in your community this week to tangibly be the hands and feet of Jesus? Where can you move out? 
You heard on the video in the beginning that we have a Move Out Network. And if you go on our website and you look at our Move Out Network, you can have all kinds of communities of people that are in particular giftings moving out in our community different networks, we'd love you to connect there and reach out. And actually, one of the cool things that we have going is we have a a week from tomorrow, actually, we're gonna be having an online move out conference, a two hour conference. In fact, there it is. You can go to kensingtonchurch.org forward slash move out Monday and you can find all about that. I'd love you to be part of that digital event. You can come in and you can find out how we can move out and be the church. Here's what the early church knew. They understood the importance of physical therapy. (laughs) And they understood the importance of time like this to actually care for a community. This year in a year of unrest and uncertainty and challenging, this is a time where we can actually learn from the early church the importance of connection, of generosity or sharing, and the importance of moving. As we move out in a time that God is saying, this is the time of the church. This is your time. So let's learn from that this week. Let's take those three questions and I would challenge you to move out this week in each one of those categories. Pick one, pick all three. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the example. Lord, thank you for the dupins. Thank you for everyone that's moving out and taking you. Lord, let us realize today that we are made in the image of a communal God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Then in our very DNA, Wherever we go, we can create community and we can create belonging and we can bring you into the midst. Father, would you connect our hearts deeper? Would you connect our souls and minds? Would you create deeper community during this time? Would you give us a vision to share, to open our hands and to give away? Would you give us a vision to move, to move out into every network that we have that's unique to us individually and collectively. We thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. And we give this day and this time and this moment to you. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Audrey's gonna lead us in a thought right here. Uh, That's a song called For the One. I really think this is a a beautiful song that really is just a, a prayer a lot of ways where it's just asking the Lord to help me to do exactly what you've called me to do. And that is to love, just to love with everything that we've got. And that the Lord allows us and makes our hearts open to receive and love unconditionally. And so I really just uh, invite you all to take a moment and just listen to the words of the song and pray this prayer with us.
invite you all to stand with us as we sing one last song out together. It's all called Build My Life. It says that we're going to put our hope and our trust in the arms of Jesus. Let's sing this one together. Worthy. 
and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be chasing out So I really pray that God fills us and that sends us out today that we can show the love of Christ around us. And so I would ask you to connect, uh, to connect us through the website. If you're watching online here, when you walk out in the hub, we'd love to hear your story. Shake your hand. I just met a new couple that just started coming, what, a month or so ago. So grateful for that. Uh, so please connect. Uh, we'd love to see you uh, next weekend as we continue this series. This week, connect, share, and move. We'll see you next week.